as I saw her the other day. Okay. Welcome everybody to tonight's uh, school committee meeting. Uh, Erica, can you lead us in the uh, Pledge of Allegiance, please? Pledge of Allegiance to, to the flag, flag of the United, United States, States of America, America and to the Republic, Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, I'd like to start with the uh, consent agenda, the minutes to uh, the April 25th, 2019 minute, uh, meeting, and the oath of bills of payroll. Make a motion to accept the cons consent agenda and oath to bills and payroll as in the <laughs> as stated. As stated. There we go. Second. Uh, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Don't choke on it, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> I just didn't want to make a noise until. Uh, at the beginning and end of each meeting, we uh, allow interested citizens to come up and address the topic to the uh, school committee. If there's any citizens tonight that would like to speak to the school committee, no, you're seeing none. We'll move on to uh, recognition. Uh, short. Uh, Tonight is our uh, second series, so to speak, of our Teaching and Excellence Award. Uh, this is a time of year that uh, we're able to honor four teachers within our district. Uh, as stated many times, we're fortunate to have a, a many, many wonderful teachers, and our principals have a very difficult time uh, selecting a winner every year, and uh, that's a good thing. And so, having said that, uh, we're going to start with uh, Principal Temple with uh, the middle school teaching in excellence. Good evening. When charged with the responsibility of selecting a teacher to be awarded the Excellence in Teaching Award, I thought about all the characteristics that I look for in an outstanding teacher. Student engagement, organization, classroom management, a variety of teaching techniques, and mastery of the content were a few things that quickly came to mind. While there are several teachers at the middle school who are very deserving of this award, this year's recipient of the Excellence in Teaching Award is special educator Angie Gresco. When the teaching position in the lab program was posted, Angie called to inquire about it and to express her interest. While she was enthusiastic about possibly returning to the middle school, she was also concerned about leaving Russell Street. When I reached out to Principal Bazidlo, he stated that losing Angie would be a devastating loss for the Russell Street School, but that he supported her decision. When Angie joined the LMS staff in September, it did not take long to understand why Principal Bazidlo had such high praise for her. Angie spent <coughs> many hours over the summer organizing the classroom spaces and planning units of instruction for her students. She met with grade level teachers, selected appropriate materials, and worked collaboratively with the other lab teacher and the assistant principal to individually create academic schedules for each of her students. Students are always engaged while they are in Mrs. Gresco's classroom. She utilizes every minute of each class period. Whether students are reading orally, working with a partner, having a group discussion, or singing the helping verb song, they are actively learning. Mrs. Gresco also stresses the importance of organization. She makes sure that students record their daily homework assignments, put their materials away in appropriate place in their notebook, and return materials to their correct spaces in the classroom. Social emotional learning is very important to Mrs. Gresco. She wants her students to be kind to one another, appreciate each other's strengths, and understand that everyone has weaknesses. It is very common to see Mrs. Gresco in the cafeteria during her lunch period while she checks in with her students. She is always available before school and it is not unusual to see her car in the LMS parking lot long after the school day is over. Mrs. Gresco is a wonderful addition to the LMS staff and I look forward to working with her for years to come. It is with great pleasure that I present this year's Excellence in Teaching Award to Angie Gresco. Now you get to give a speech. No. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations.
come, come up into the ring, so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a picture taken? Which one do I get? Or two? Let's say three. And uh, our second uh, award this evening uh, will be given to a high school teacher, and I'll turn it over to Dr. Harrington. Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure, similar to Principal Temple, to recognize a special educator in the Littleton Public Schools for Excellence in Teaching. Uh, when I was listening to Cheryl talk about Angie Gresco, it reminded me so many of the qualities of tonight's re recipient from Littleton High School. Um, and we are happy tonight to honor a special education teacher and a transition specialist, uh, also a Littleton resident. Her name is Michelle Hurth. Uh, she is the recipient of uh, this year's Excellence in Teaching Award at Littleton High School. And when I, I was putting my words together uh, this morning and this afternoon uh, in recognition of this honor for Michelle, uh, I received an email from a colleague and I wanted to share uh, some words from this colleague about Michelle. I was expecting a few bullet points, but it was a bit of a narrative, and it was very impressive, and I thought captured a lot of what I wanted to say tonight and to the public about Michelle. So, uh, Michelle, you're probably going to want to find out who this is, but uh, uh, let, here we go. A colleague recently shared the following comments about Michelle. This was just today. Michelle helps bridge the gap between high school and the years beyond as a transition coordinator. She teaches students about the Americans with Disabilities Act and how to be effectively, or how to effectively self-advocate by knowing and describing their learning disabilities in order to ac access accommodations in higher education and the workplace. She prepares them for life beyond school by teaching about banking, budgeting, allocating time efficiently, interviewing skills, job hunting for your first employment experience, how to discern appropriate education and career paths, and how to live independently. She takes the show on the road with a school van <laughs> from time to time <laughs> by taking students on the uh, um, bus system, the commuter rail, local colleges, and their disability resource offices, uh, vocational training programs in local banks and shops, and even the Registry of Motor Vehicles. Uh, she has coordinated relationships with the Council on Aging, Meals on Wheels, the Littleton Community Farm, and the local businesses to arrange for work internships for special education students who are transitioning from LHS. Michelle also serves as the person who arranges and tracks accommodations for students with special needs who are taking the SATs and ACTs. She serves as a liaison for special education students with significant needs. Michelle arranges for coordinating programs to, um, to work with students and arrange speakers to come present uh, to staff for professional development to better prepare all of us in helping students to transition again in the life beyond high school. She does all of this, all of this, with a consistent smile, a can-do attitude, and a sense of humor. Michelle believes in her students and imbues them with confidence during a particularly nerve-wracking time in life. She consistently lends a hand to colleagues and handles daily challenges with multiple student and staff schedules seamlessly. She encourages everyone um, and is simply a joy to be around. If you spend time with Michelle, you will learn about transition education and also horses, yeah. and dogs, and art yeah. history. Yeah. Um, but most of all, you will have a mentor and a role model to be a better teacher yourself. Tonight, we confirm with confidence your strengths and skills <coughs> in the classroom and your excellence as a teacher. This year's recipient of the LPS Excellence in Teaching Award at Littleton High School is Mrs. Michelle Hart. <laughs> I could shake your hand, but you got to, yeah, after all that. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. I'm looking one out. Yeah, one out. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. All right, here we go. Thank you. And if you can 
just send that to me. We'll put it on Twitter. Yeah. Be all over social media. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, with this award, uh, Michelle and Angie, uh, you also have $500 uh, for your classroom. So uh, have fun spending. Great. Thank you very much. You guys are welcome to stay for the meeting, but you don't. Thank you. <laughs> And I want to express uh, our appreciation for the excellent work that uh, not only you, but all the staff do uh, for our students uh, in the district. And, uh, congratulations on your uh, award tonight. Thank you. Say in it's a real team effort. So it's um, not just one person, but the whole group, including our administration. So thank you very much. Our uh, student report, Madeline, do you want to give us an update? All right, so we got a lot for the high school, so bear with me. Yeah. But um, so AP exams are taking place this week and next week for our juniors and seniors. And we have a new thing called the LHS Paint Night that's sponsored by our new art club. Um, Kriti Sharma is actually running it. Um, so that's going to be on May 17th, um, so come if you want. Um, Relay for Life is on May 18th. The Staff Appreciation Luncheon was yesterday. Um, on May 10th upcoming is the PTA Trivia Night. That's going to be at VFW at 6 p.m. Um, the NHS Banquet, or National Honor Society Banquet, will be on May 17th. Um, that will be honoring seniors that are graduating and introducing new members. And MCAS exams for the sophomores will be on May 22nd, uh, 21st <coughs> to 22nd. Um, I don't know much about the middle school, but I do know that they are the eighth graders are having their DC trip uh, coming up soon. So that's fun. My sister's going on that. So. <laughs> Um, Russell Street, nothing going on, but a shout out to Ms. Romano and the volunteers and all the students that participated in the art show. That made it amazing. Um, and nothing for the Shaker Lane. So, yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, we have a, a few more. A few more. Sure. Yeah. <coughs> uh, <coughs> last, uh, last part of April, <coughs> excuse me, we had the uh, annual middle school science fair. Uh, another in incredible experience, uh, some of the projects that were there. Kids, all of our students worked really hard and, and did a great job uh, presenting their findings. Uh, uh, they certainly uh, knew what they were after and what their hypotheses was and, and uh, very proud to see all of uh, the opportunities we have uh, this time of year to celebrate our students' successes. I mean, it's, a, it's a great time of year, it's a busy time of year, but we were able to showcase uh, our student successes uh, in a variety of events. Uh, Dr. Harrington and I were uh, fortunate once again to attend the uh, Merrimack Valley uh, Scholars Luncheon sponsored by the Superintendents Association on, on May 1st. Uh, this year, uh, Sarah Gordon and uh, Ella Heitmeyer were honored uh, at this event. Uh, there were, Dr. Harrington was a 20, 20 yeah, 28, yeah, 28 school districts that uh, honor two or, or three students, depending on the size of, of the high school, uh, at this event. We have a nice dinner. And uh, it's one of the, the uh, most proudest events that, that the superintendent and, and uh, high school principal can, can attend. When you sit back and, and have the opportunity to listen to the accomplishments of the students and, and what their uh, destined to do in the colleges and universities that they're accepted to, uh, it makes you very, very proud. And uh, I can say with confidence that uh, we're in good hands when you, you have the opportunity to listen to our, our top scholars uh, speak and uh, also uh, look at what they're going to do in, in the future. So uh, again, one of, one of our highlights uh, for the year. And uh, moving on, we have uh, an R R R R RSS uh, art show, Russell Street Art Show, that Madeline already mentioned. Our art shows are, are incredible, and the amount of work <coughs> that goes into preparing for them. Our, t our staff, uh, volunteers work so hard. Uh, the Russell Street uh, Art Show was incredible. They had a, a number of other opportunities. Green screen was set up, and, and they uh, had ceramic cupcakes 
in, in the library and, and if you used a scanner, you could uh, scan on them and then it would show the, the student doing a presentation and how they were made, etc. So we, we managed to uh, uh, inject some technology so it was truly a STEAM event and, and not just an art show. So again, another very proud moment uh, for our district. Uh, Best Buddies uh, sponsored a hypnotist uh, show uh, during town meeting. <laughs> and uh, fr from what I understand, it was a, a great success. Uh, always impressed with the students and staff that volunteered uh, to uh, make sure our Best Buddies program is successful every year. And they're very creative and come up with some great ideas. Uh, we also uh, attended a uh, high, school, uh, high school art show and uh, spring concert uh, on May 7th uh, this week. Uh, our, our band, our chorus group, uh, jazz band, were, were incredible. I've had the, the good or the, the opportunity uh, to watch this program grow for almost nine years now. And I just can't believe what, what uh, the, the improvement that I've seen during that time. The musical selection was, was varied, but complex. Uh, you, you couldn't uh, be on that stage without having a, a very good understanding and, and uh, Ability to uh, play play the various instruments. Uh, uh, shout out to Mrs. Bridge. Uh, she handled that whole concert by herself for the first time as we reorganized. And, and uh, one of Mrs. Bridge's dreams was to be at the high school most of the time, and, and she's almost 100% at the high school. But what comes with that is more responsibility for that concert. It was close to two hours, I believe, in length, and, and uh, again, an incredible evening. Our high school uh, art teachers had an opportunity to have an art show at the same time. It was nice to combine both events. And we have incredible artists in our district. <coughs> and and uh, you know, it begins in, in pre-K and kindergarten. Uh, on that note, uh, I guess one of my dreams is, is finally coming true. Uh, in every district that I've been a superintendent in or a principal in, uh, we've always had a high school art gallery talking about it for a number of years and it's going to uh, be actualized at the end of this year. We'll be selecting a number of uh, uh, pieces of uh, student artwork and framing them and we're going to start uh, displaying them around the high school library. So I'm, I'm excited about that. I think every school needs to showcase uh, every possible subject discipline that you can and, and uh, it'll be a nice, nice addition to our high school. We were also uh, honored uh, with our partnership with the uh, Littleton Water Department and uh, the school department and the water department received the Star L Award and what this means is presented by the Department of Environmental Protection and it recognized our uh, outstanding partnership uh, with the water department in ensuring that uh, our schools have uh, the best water possible and in this particular case it, uh, we were awarded this uh, prestigious award uh, for the uh, reduction in uh, lead in the water in all of our schools. Uh, we're very fortunate in our town to have very strong partnerships with, with all of our departments and this is just one example of, of the many uh, partnerships that we have. So I'm going to pass this around to the school committee. We, we obviously have the award uh, at the event and uh, Steve Mark actually attended the event on the school department's behalf and accepted the award. I thought you had a picture there. I did. It was on the screen. Oh, okay. I, I guess I, I should have looked at <coughs> <them> over there. <laughs> <laughs> that was a quick shot. So. <laughs> and we also have a citation uh, from the State Senate. So we'll pass those to the end. And that's uh, it for recognition. Thank you very much, Kelly. Uh, let's see. So while we're looking at that, can we also key up the uh, field trip request? <laughs> Sure. Once again, the middle school is here this evening to uh, talk uh, uh, about the Canopy uh, Lake field trip. Uh, maybe I should stop there. This is always my opportunity <coughs> every year to talk about the importance of enunciating vowels. <coughs> but for some reason, in this word, it's not enunciated. <laughs> I apologize. I am not Dry Antricana. She was planning on being here tonight, but was something came up in her family. She was unable to be here. Um, so on behalf of Diane Tricana and the sixth grade team, I'm here to ask permission for the um, their traditional um, Canopy Lake field trip um, uh, for the sixth grade. Um, they're 
would like to plan the trip for Monday, June 17th with a rain date of Tuesday, June 18th. Um, and the reason I'm asking permission is because it's out of state. Uh, we approve this one every year, but if anybody has a questions that they'd like to ask, Miller, well, now you got the chance, uh, entertain a motion to approve the uh, field trip. Make a motion to approve the canopy like our field trip for the sixth grade. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Uh, Aye. Opposed? You're all set to go. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that was the easy one. Uh, let's see. I will uh, probably mess up saying the acronym. We have a presentation on the youth risks behaviors. Survey. 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 <laughs> <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> what we've done this year, uh, those of you that have been on the school committee for, for a while, I guess tonight that's Daryl. Uh, <laughs> All right. <laughs> we'll, re <laughs> we'll remember that we used to have a fellow by the name of Jim Burns that uh, was, was hired uh, by Emerson, and, and his job was to uh, create and administer the Arbus survey. And uh, we, we were able to, to have him come out and speak about the survey every year, but he retired a couple of years ago, and we brought in a, uh, somebody from a company that, that helps oversee Arvis. Uh, they're not doing that anymore, so <coughs> we had an opportunity to meet with uh, all of the districts uh, that are part of the Arvis survey, and uh, what we discussed is uh, what's the best way to uh, present some succinct data to our communities, and we came up with the concept of an executive summary, which we created uh, one for the middle school and, and one for the high school with a link to the survey. So we're, what we're doing tonight is, is we're not only talking about the Arvis survey, but we had an opportunity this year to uh, design and, and uh, actualize student focus groups, the middle school and high school. And uh, we're gonna tie that data in to the uh, data that, that's uh, directly uh, <coughs> resulted from the Arvis survey. And what this really, really is, is we identified two areas that, that we wanted to focus on. And one was academic stress, and the other one was bullying prevention. And, and uh, that's what we concentrated on with our focus groups. But as you know, when you structure focus groups the right way and uh, give our students enough time, uh, we were able to uh, diverge into a variety of, of, of conversations. Very valuable. I'm uh, certainly recommending that uh, both these schools find mm -hmm. times to do that every year. Uh, as a leadership team and as a superintendent, uh, we're committed to finding ways of, of uh, encouraging student voice. I think that's something that every school district can, can become better at. And uh, this was a, a bigger uh, dip into the waters, so to speak, as we, we find ways to engage our students more in, in uh, helping shape our schools for, for the future. So with that, uh, I, ha I have to pose a question. Which school would uh, like to go first? I hope I don't have to treat this like <laughs> the beginning of a football game and flip a coin. But We're up there. We're already on the screen. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> <coughs> You just have to disperse your questions fairly between both schools. <laughs> so we just want to tell you a little bit about um, sort of um, how the Youth Risk Behavior Survey works and what we did with the information at the middle school uh, and what we're continuing to do with the information. So um, just for the purposes of the people not sitting in this room, the Youth Risk Behavior Survey um, is conducted every other year um, in all of the surrounding towns. Um, it was, it's conducted in March. And the, um, last year when this survey was conducted, uh, we had 130 sixth graders at the middle school and 105 eighth grade students who completed the survey. It's an, an anonymous survey um, given electronically. So for our, it, 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 there's a whole range of questions in this survey. So some of the highlights for middle school students um, that we pulled out of the survey were um, really important to us. 75% of Littleton youth reported that they participated in vigorous physical activity three or more days during the previous week. That's really important to us because it's something that we um, emphasize in health class and in PE class. 
um, and in our regular academic classes, the importance of physical activity so that we were happy to see that statistic. 63% of sixth graders and 36% of eighth graders reported getting eight or more hours of sleep on school nights. Another thing we emphasize, so we were happy to see that reported. 90% of Littleton youth surveyed are involved in one or more out of school time activities, including sports, clubs, band, and choir. The majority of Littleton youth surveyed reported that they always wear a helmet when they're riding their bike, skiing, or snowboarding. Um, another safety statistic. Most Littleton youth wear seat belts while they are a passenger in a car, and 75% of Littleton youth said um, there's at least one teacher or adult in their school that they can talk to if they had a problem, and that was really important to us as well. Um, in general, in the survey, alcohol and tobacco use were trending downward among students, um, but the survey showed that across all districts, um, all towns surveyed that um, the use of vaping has increased um, among students in sixth and eighth grade. According to the results of the 2018 survey, vaping amongst youth in the area public schools doubled since 2016. Um, from 10% in 2016, um, students reported to 20% in 2018. Um, the most common vape, um, excuse me, in um, only 3% of Littleton sixth grade students um, and 14% of Littleton's eighth grade students reported using electronic cigarettes. Um, so certainly that's something that you'll hear in a minute that we have um, taken steps to address. School was identified as the greatest source of stress by students attending Littleton Middle School. They indicated that they use exercise, watching television, and eating to deal with their stress. Some students, 20%, rely on meditation or relaxation activities to help reduce stress. stress. And bullying was identified as, identified as repeated threatening, threatening, humiliating, or acting in a hostile manner towards another person. Those rates of bullying were reported somewhat higher than the aggregate of 8%. Um, for all districts, 22% of our sixth graders reported bullying and 13% of eighth graders reported being bullied, which was um, substantially higher than the aggregate. Um, in response to the information that we analyzed, um, obviously we continued to look at the aggregate and those trends that are, are um, higher for Littleton Middle School. Concerns such as stress and bullying, um, where our numbers were much higher than the aggregate. Um, we shared this information with the middle school teaching staff. Um, we discussed implications to the findings, both in terms of curriculum content, um, as well as our school culture. And um, subsequently, a portion called Project Alert was added to our health curriculum, um, an additional curriculum to address the increase in vaping. Um, we are regularly assessing levels of stress via student discussions um, to, help to continue to understand the increase of academic stress and why that's happening. Um, and bullying obviously needed for further clarification. So Jason is going to talk about the next step that we took to analyze this information and to get more real-time information from our students. When you, when you take a look at the, the results of the YRBS survey, <coughs> there, are, there are a few of the numbers that do jump out at you, and so we decided that it was, it was really worth our time and effort to sort of dig a little deeper to find out exactly what the students meant when they answered the way that they did. Rather than just taking the numbers at face value and, and, and reacting to it, we decided to go a little bit further. And so Sarah Dorfman, our, our school adjustment counselor, um, created a series of grade level focus groups. Twelve students from each group randomly chosen to participate. We chose 12 because it would give us a nice sort of 10% ratio of the focus group to the grade to go, sort of allow us to sort of calibrate the numbers that, that, that we had seen. Um, these discussions were held over a series of, of lunchtime, dis or these discussions were held over a series of lunches in which follow-up questions to the YRBS survey were asked, just sort of to dig a little deeper to find out what the students were really getting at. And one thing that came up was really interesting, spe specifically regarding bullying. A lot of the students use the term bullying sort of as a catch-all for anything that, that includes a comment that they don't like, that makes them feel bad, but it doesn't necessarily fit the term bullying that we use as educators when we talk about the real repeated, um, targeted kind of language. And so we introduced them to the term microaggression. And I don't know if anybody's familiar with that term. It's a relatively new term, born out of sort of the differentiation between bullying and sort of its other subsets. And so I, I included it in, in the summary, but I want to read it to you just, just, uh, just to be clear. That a microaggression is a comment or an action 
that subtly and often unconsciously or unintentionally expresses derogatory or negative messages to target specific persons. And what we were finding with the students and the, and the complaints that they were having about the way that they are spoken to by other students, that a lot of the comments really fit more under this microaggression category as opposed to the traditional bullying, which is threatening, right, often violent, humiliating, repeated. And so once we sort of ask the students, you know, where do you think most much of what you hear lies, which category, almost every one of them said if they could, they would choose a microaggression option as the response instead of the bully. And so that what that did is it really freed up the conversation to say, okay, let's talk about these microaggressions. When do they happen? Where do they happen? How do they make you feel? And so we were able to really dig deeper into a, into a lot of that information. And so from there, we were able to do two things. One, we conducted a, a whole staff professional development opportunity, sort of on what a microaggression is, the difference between that and bullying, and how do we address that in the classroom? And then two, to have a series of grade level, individual grade level meetings, in which we would talk about the individual results by the grade level focus group, so the teachers could get something a little bit more specific. And then from there, we, we asked for an action plan from teachers. What specifically do you intend to do with this information? And what practices, what changes to your practice will you make as a result? Teachers then documented what it was they intended to do. They submitted that information. And it's going to become a part of, of our focus next year in how we address some of these things. Much of what teachers chose to do is similar to what we, we know they already do quite often in their classes. But I think there's a mindfulness component that's really being added. Just making sure that you are in the hallways more often than you might realize during busy times. If you hear a microaggression in class, rather than sort of just dismissing it in the moment, to really taking a moment to say, you know what, we're gonna, we're gonna stop what we're doing and we're gonna tackle this right now because everybody needs to know that this is not something we tolerate. And so those mindful practices really became the focus of what, what we did. So we, we chose that two-pronged approach, hoping that whole school and individual by team, we could begin to sort of move the needle back towards something um, that was a little bit more appropriate for what we wanted to see, and we'll see as the, as the weeks and months progress the, the success of that work. We have already taken steps um, to address the issues that came out of the survey um, from the start of this year. Um, the middle school, um, we changed the schedule a bit in the fall to include rotation in the morning and a, a rotation in the afternoon. Um, this allows students to have a different class to start their day a couple of days a week. Um, also a different class before lunch, a different class to end the day, where before, if you didn't like math and you had math first period every day, sometimes it was made it hard to come to school. So this, um, the little change in the schedule um, was very well received by students and staff to change up their day a little bit. Um, Littleton Middle School is committed to having home or free weekend each month. Um, we um, don't assign new assignments during holidays or vacation weeks. We also added a relaxation station in our library area this fall, so students can stop by this area, take a break, uh, draw, they can, there's fidgets in there that they can play with, they can do a yoga pose, um, and then there's a timer there so they can just spend five minutes, the timer goes off and they can go back to class. Um, students on their own stop by this area. We um, have a stationary bike that's in the guidance area, this in our, our downstairs guidance area this year that students can come and take a break on, um, and we also have a treadmill um, in the school psychologist's office upstairs. So those are all things where when students are feeling like they have extra energy or they're feeling really stressed during the day, they can stop by, spend five minutes there, feel more relaxed and be able to turn, return to class. Um, and we've seen um, some implications with uh, a decrease in discipline for some of those students who are able to do that instead of act out in the class. Um, so that has been really successful for us. Um, we also added this year uh, a human rights club that was added um, to our club offering so that students who are particularly vulnerable to discipline um, have a safe space to discuss issues and find support. Um, our mural club uh, also took on a project this year to paint a, um, inspirational quotes and sayings on restroom doors um, as just a reminder that we're kind of all in this same boat together. So those have been some things that we've added. As Jason indicated, um, the teachers were very forthcoming with um, immediate suggestions for what things that they could do right away that day. Um, you know, we talked about to them about the microaggressions. Many of the students, you know, that doesn't happen right under a student's nose during an academic 
um, portion of their day, it's in the hallway or during transitions. And one of the things that really helps with that is, is if teachers and adults are um, visible in hallway spaces, in the lobby area, um, during, during those transition times. So that's something that could be added immediately. Um, so we were, we were pleased, again, there's always um, information that comes out of these surveys that need to be addressed, but we want to reassure you um, that we take the information seriously and that we take steps immediately to address um, you know, the things that are of concern to us. Any questions? <coughs> okay, so hearing you speak about bullying and micro, the differences between mm -hmm. bullying and microaggressions, I started thinking, um, do you, and just to clarify in the beginning, was there, you were saying that um, the number of bullying incidents reported by Littleton students is higher than the others in this local area? Is, was that comparison made? In the yeah. YRBS yes. survey, yeah, okay. the bullying was, our, our students indicated okay. a higher percentage than the right. aggregate. Right, okay. And so um, I was curious if, mm, is that, so your correction to, uh, of, you know, making the students understand that microaggressions are different than bullying, do you think that's something other districts actually um, cover? So would we also expect their percentage, you know, percentages to drop in that category? I can, I, I can Or is that something I can that I can speak on a personal people. level as, right. as, as a person who I've worked the last 10 years, previous 10 years in Cambridge, the term microaggression and what it is yeah. is, a, is very well embedded into professional yeah. development and staff meetings. Uh, my wife is a, is a teacher in Newton, mm -hmm. and she's actually the one who introduced me to the term mm -hmm. because she would be quick to point it out anytime I accidentally used a microaggression. Mm -hmm. And sure. in my house, <laughs> we've gotten pretty good at saying, ah, oh, microaggression, but <laughs> you know, it's the ongoing professional development that is my married life. Um, but, but in that way, it's, it's something that when we started to discuss it here, it was, it was something I had already been mm -hmm. familiar with. Has it made its way around? Clearly not, because it's, it's not included in the survey. I wish, and I think what it really gets down to is I wish the students had more options when it comes to some of their choices. Mm -hmm. Instead of choosing the, you know, the, the, the most sensational word possible, mm -hmm. when it doesn't really apply. And so I think being able to sort of differentiate that a little bit. Now, does that mean that we should not worry about bullying and take our eye off of that? No, of course not. We take that very seriously. But we also want to make sure that we protect student rights and not just call something bullying when it's not because because it does cut more. Because there is a definition in this thing. Sure, we absolutely. Don't, we don't have a, with this survey being an anonymous survey, we don't have any way to go back to the students and find out. So, so um, even though it wasn't the same students that took the survey, we, by um, coordinating the focus groups, we were able to say to current students, you know, this is what came up on the YRBS survey. What do you think? and have real conversation right. about like what really happens in the hallway, in the locker room, places mm -hmm. we might not be around, what really happens? And that's where we got this information from kids that when right. we said, you know, 22% of kids said that they've been bullied, our own kids were surprised by that and really talked about, like described what actually happened, which led Sarah to understand it's not actual bull bullying, it's these microaggressions. And when she explained them to the students, they said, yes, that's what happens. That's what right. they identified. And it was interesting to have, we had a whole, like Jason said, professional development at a staff meeting, um, and Sarah gave a presentation about the microaggressions with examples, um, and that it was, it led to a big discussion after that of things that we really have to, it's something specific that you have to watch for in your classroom, and it happens just, you know, at this age group, it's something kids kind of do automatically, and it's really important and on us to stop that when that happens yeah. and address it. And is there like a, I don't know, specific process right now that you guys have created to deal with those, you know, like with a preschooler, you know, you like give them script, like the kid says like, no, don't say that to me, I don't like that. You teach a kid to like stand up for themselves early on or. Yeah, it, it um, was in the, there's, a, there's some indicators in the youth risk behaviors in the survey itself about what our students do at telling the person to stop and things like that. We, this blends right in with the social emotional learning initiative because if that happens in the class where our expectation is that you stop and that's a lesson for everybody it's not just for those students where that's happening but that's a, that's a quick lesson for everybody in the whole class this is not okay this is not what we expect this this is this right. leads to a negative culture and that's not what we want and and there is some changing thought about how you address it in the moment um, you know I, I, I was uh, a part of a seminar and 
the, regarding some of the language that you might hear in, in hallways and, and how you address it. And, and the woman who, who was um, the coordinator of the medical program in the state talked about specifically around race, but I think it applies in, in other areas too. There was a time where you would stop what you're doing and you address it, you call 100% of attention to it, you make the example. And, and what she said is that a lot of that's changing now because what that does is that adds a, a value judgment to the student to say you are bad because you use this word. And while the, the word might be bad or the thought might be inappropriate, to, to apply that to a student may not be the most effective. So it's really about drawing to say time and place. In this building, we do not approve of this, right? With the way you speak at home, the way you speak at the point, these are your choices. But in this building, this is what we believe. And so that's something that we're currently looking at is how do we draw that out so that there is an appropriate way to handle it, that it is addressed in the moment, but it, it doesn't attach negative connotations so that students feel yeah. lower self-worth because they made a poor word choice. Uh, <clears throat> Jen covered most of my points, but I think uh, I, I think you're on the right track. I think these are two really important uh, issues that we need to address. Um, you know, obviously, I, th I feel like bullying has been a uh, really hot topic over the past 10 to 15 years. And as a, uh, but as a high school teacher, the one thing that's really allowing me is the use of the vaping. Um, I see it constantly in my own school, and it's, it's a lot different than when I was in high school, and you could smell somebody smoking in the bathroom, you, you just don't know. Right. what kids are and and what they're actually smoking because there's different oils you can put in there and um, so like I said I think you're doing a good job and putting some good points in place to address these issues thank you um, yeah so one thing that you did not bring up that was a big area of concern for me was the jump in children who actually had an attempt, a uh, suicide attempt in the last year. Um, went up, I mean, it went up from 0% to 6% this year, and it had been around the 1 to 2% range for many years. I mean, we're talking about eight sixth graders attempting suicide within the last year. That's very concerning to me. Um, and I think it plays into the bullying um, question because you know you go into some of the data about who those kids are who are who's experiencing um, depression and who's going to make a suicide attempt and bullying is right up there as one of mm -hmm. um, the causes and so we were really stymied by that one the the uh, aggregate is three percent and it said in this survey that our that six percent of our sixth grade students um, answered that question positively to attempted suicide in the past month. Um, we um, did not have a single report um, from a family, the parents, another student, um, a caregiver, the police department, anyone, that any a suicide attempt had happened with any of our students in the past 12 months. Um, so we are certainly scratching our heads trying to figure this one out. One of the things that we wonder is if you, in this youth risk behavior survey, if you look, um, the question about depression in the past six months is not asked of sixth graders, so they don't have an opportunity to indicate if they're feeling depressed. And any and self-injury is not a question that's asked of the sixth graders. So it jumps right from bullying onto attempted suicide, and they don't have any other area to answer a, a question about depression or any of those other symptoms. And our take at this point, um, the best we can figure out is that any student who had any indi indicator in self-injury or depression put their answer in that field. Um, and so, you know, it's something, one of the things I will add is that even though the Youth Risk Behavior Survey happens at sixth grade, at seventh grade, and, um, at the beginning of seventh grade, or in seventh grade, the students do the SOS um, which is the signs of suicide um, assessment. They do it every single year, um, and we do a follow-up with each student. So every student um, in seventh grade, unless their parent has asked for them to opt out, um, does that survey, and that's specifically about signs of suicide. Um, and every student who indicates um, the scale is on a one to five, and any student who indicates a three, a four, or a five, we follow up with. Um, 
and the students have a um, an in, uh, have an opportunity on there to write. I want to speak with someone. I want my family to be contacted, um, and that we put a whole team together to um, to do that survey every single year. So so while in sixth grade. Um, you know, we, we really didn't have an answer to that 6%. We do know that as of this year, those students have, have gone through the SOS process. Um, it's really typical to not be informed because it's almost impossible to, to not have a tie-in in terms of a, a safety plan for a child. So it's quite perplexing. Uh, with all the years of experience I have in school districts, uh, if I look at our high school, very rarely, if any, are we not informed of something like that. So it's, it is perplexing. And as soon as another agency becomes involved, we're, we're, we're informed. So this is something that we're, we're, we're struggling with as to the, the number and the, the lack of, of correlation of that number with, with our knowledge base in terms of being notified or, or working with families. But if a family didn't, I mean, there's, as much as I hate to say it, there's still a stigma attached to depression and, and suicide. And so if a family chose not to inform you because they didn't, they were afraid of that stigma. I mean, you know, I, there's a possibility. We don't, we don't know. Um, yeah, I will, I will a say, yeah, and I will say that, um, you know, on a weekly basis, we, our guidance department and school psychologists are dealing with if another student, like our students at the middle school do through our health um, curriculum, um, really know that if somebody says something to them that's alarming, they should say something. And so our kids almost overly report, and we're happy about that. Um, you know, you know, we have just we have teachers that will get an email because a student was nervous in the middle, you know, late at night, and sent an email to the teacher. Um, kids will come to the guidance office and report. You know, I'm worried about my friend, and so any of those issues. Um, are addressed immediately at school. So it's not, it isn't that we don't have kids come and say, I'm concerned about my friend or I'm feeling really sad. We do have that um, and we address that. And if Sarah were here, she would have a lot to say about that. Um, you know, we have ongoing communications with families whose students we know are feeling depressed and, and um, you know, we really um, maintain constant communication for those students, um, you know, who are, who are dealing with that at this point um, but to answer to that 6%, we really can't. <clears throat> uh, no, thank you. I, I took a quick look also the other day through the uh, pieces there, and again, the, the increase in vaping, it actually seems to be, have exceeded the historical usage of tobacco, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in terms of the amount uh, there, particularly at the high school, but I'll save that for the mm -hmm. high school thing. I recognize we can, you know, we need to pick a few areas to focus on there. But what's a little disturbing, I think, I'm also seeing a rising trend is the starting in sixth grade, the misuse of prescription drugs, mm -hmm. not not only their own but others uh, type of thing. There again, it's it's difficult. You can't always deal with all of that within a school setting. Um, and I, I think I'm wondering at some point how do we do different outreach to the parents also for their involvement in both the prescriptions, the alcohol use, and the um, t you know tobacco, and really it's the vaping uh, right. pieces there. Because I don't think we can address all of that within the school. Uh, <laughs> right, and certainly, you know, I will say, and knock on something, that, um, you know, we feel, I believe that we have students in the middle school who are vaping they're not vaping at the middle school. <laughs> and so I had dinner recently with some other principals who said, this is a constant, this is all I do all day long. Um, and I was thinking, wow, in another middle school, that's what's happening, that's not happening in ours. We have had one incident in the past two years of someone just bringing something to school to show other students and the, the student threw it away. Um, and then students came right away and said, we saw this, they had it, and we found it in the trash. Um, but no one had used it. It was simply someone took it from home. Um, we haven't had any incidents at school that that have been reported to us or that, uh, but again, 
when we're planning on the Washington DC trip, that's something that they talk about with students. Um, it is a whole curriculum. Because of the increase, we've had multiple um, staff who've gone out to training on vaping, and the, uh, the administrators had a training through admin council um, to show us all the variety of devices, because many of them look like thumb drives and things like that. Um, and um, they added a whole cur uh, another curriculum piece in the health class to address that as a concern. We also partnered with uh, LPD this year, and they did a six-week uh, course mm -hmm. with our students that focused on those areas. And our and also for the um, alcohol and drugs, we um, there is an SBIRT survey, S B I R T, that's um, administered to seventh graders as well. Um, that's a, a question, an in-person question survey about um, drugs and alcohol. We questioned um, the last time we were talking about the youth risk behavior survey, we talked about the prescription drugs. And when I went back to school and talked to the guidance and Sarah and, uh, Sarah and um, Trish Bonacore, Trish Bonacore uh, maintained, as I did, that we were not sure that sixth graders understood what prescription medication actually was. And she talked about, um, you know, versus getting a, you know, a children's Tylenol versus mom's Advil or whatever. Um, and so she added a whole piece um, to make sure that at least our, she added a whole piece in health class to make sure that when our students took this, they were educated about the questions that they were answering. Um, and that's one of the pieces. Um, Sarah and, and Maureen are both on the Youth Risk Behavior Survey Committee. Um, and so when the questions are being put together, that is one of the things that we want to make sure as sixth graders, our kids even know what they're answering. Because some of these, you know, it's just a question that you answer. And, you know, I, you know, I wonder how many students answer versus saying that they don't know. So that, you know, again, we took that into consideration and Trish Bonacore made sure she talked about that in her sixth grade classes um, to make sure kids were informed about what is actually a prescription medication versus something you know, that's over the counter that you just I, might not be familiar with. I, I, I feel this, this certainly goes well beyond the school. Uh, some type of national campaign in terms of uh, prescription uh, medications and, and the awareness that those medications are tailored for the patient, not tailored for the family. And dosages, dosages of medication are very important according to age and weight, et cetera. And also need to be taken into consideration with other medications a person is on. I think we do a better job in, in our culture in, in uh, educating families about the dangers of, of assuming that uh, you know when it's a very complicated process. And there are some cities and towns across the country that do drug buyback product mm -hmm. programs and, and pill deposit programs and the containers because of that very that very worry that a child may go into somebody else's home or a grandparents' home and see these things and take them knowingly or unknowingly, but giving resources for people to say, I don't want to just flush these things down the toilet, I don't know what to do with them. So they're actually collecting them in many cases when possible, either redistributing them or recycling them. Thank you. All right. Good evening again. Uh, I'm here with Maureen McMahon, a high school school psychologist, to present um, the findings from the Youth Risk Behavior Survey similar to the middle school. Um, we'll go over that and we'll also go over the uh, stress and bullying, or what turned out to be more of a stress and sort of climate uh, survey for us, as well as focus groups that were, follow that were followed up similar to the middle school. Uh, the superintendent was very much involved in the focus groups he participated in them. They were orchestrated or facilitated primarily by guidance counselors, the school psychologist, a, mental health ther a therapeutic mental health counselor, a new addition to our staff this year, as well as, um, you know, uh, I think, well, it was guidance counselors primarily, and the superintendent, and uh, I think uh, Mrs. Steele also attended one, uh, and I did too, I attended a, a group. Uh, so it was interesting to hear firsthand from the students to get some clarification start to begin the drilling down of uh, or extended conversation of what the findings were perceptions were that were reported in the in the survey um, uh, we're going to start off with the youth risk behavior survey summary you have an executive summary in your packet uh, there's some 
bold areas that are highlighted to bring your bring your eyes to uh, for additional consideration. Uh, there's a, a lot in this survey. I mean, I w we went over it several times, and it was what, seven, se 76 pages. The whole the whole survey in terms of the report from Emerson Hospital and the and the uh, the, the company that conducted the the survey. Um, this was done in March uh, 2018, uh, and there were about 408 participants mm -hmm. in the survey. The results, some kids skipped some questions, some kids uh, opted not to participate in the, survey, uh, in the survey based on our enrollment. Uh, it's done 9 to 12, mm -hmm. and, uh, and like I said, I'm going to turn the mic over to Maureen, who will uh, provide a, a, brief, a brief overview mm -hmm. of the key findings, and then we're happy to have extended dialogue, answer any questions. I'll follow up um, after a review of the uh, focus groups in the other sur the school-based survey uh, that was uh, led by the, the superintendent and the clinical staff and uh, provide also um, a, a rough uh, summary of what we've done so far to in response to the YRBS results, the climate survey, and what we plan to do moving ahead into the future. One of the key th things we realized, though, is, and I think it's been pointed out by members of the school committee as well as the superintendent, is that so many of these um, issues are go beyond. We've got to take responsibility and tr try to do what we can to intervene, but so many of these issues go beyond uh, the school day, go beyond uh, the, the, capac the current capacity of the school to deal with them. Uh, it's going to require the whole whole effort from the community at large. It's, there are some of these are societal issues, cultural issues that everybody's dealing with across the country. Uh, I think Matt spot put a spotlight on vaping. I hear all the time from high school principals about the pervasiveness of vaping, not just in, often in, uh, it's discreet and hidden. If right, you don't even know a student is vaping uh, in, in, a, in a classroom because it's so easy to disguise or hide. Uh, so uh, with that said, I'll, I'll, I'll comment more about that later. I'm going to turn it over to Ma Maureen. You can just sort of switch spots. Okay. Great. So um, I just have a breakdown of the main topics that we felt were important to address. The first one um, was academic stress. And we're finding that 61% of our students are reporting high levels of academic stress. Um, and that's compared to 53% of the aggregate. So um, as Dr. Clenchy mentioned, we did do those follow-up focus groups. So Dr. Harrington will talk about that a little bit in a minute. Um, when we look at academic stress, the first thing I think about is homework. So we highlighted the, the students are reporting two to three hours of homework per night. Um, and this is, in the aggregate, it's two hours. So our juniors and our freshmen are reporting they're doing three hours of homework a night. And this is pretty consistent when we talk to the students um, individually about that. Um, in terms of sleep, I know Mrs. Temple talked a little bit about um, sleep at the middle school. What we're finding is as kids progress to high school, they're sleeping less. So it was a median of six hours a night of sleep once the students got to the high school. Um, so that's certainly an area of concern, and that's less than the surrounding communities were reporting seven hours um, a night of, of sleep. Um, mm -hmm. In terms of ver vehicular s safety, 4% of LHS students reported drinking and driving within the last 30 days, and that is pretty much the same as the aggregate. And 8% of our students reported drinking, I'm sorry, using marijuana and driving. Um, the big one we've talked about tonight is vaping. So we've seen um, steadily a decrease in cigarette smoking. So in the last 14 year, 15 years, from 2004, it was 17%, and now it's 4%. But we've, we've seen vaping double in the last two years. Um, so it was 24% of LHS students reported that they had vaped in their lifetime, and that's compared to 20% of the aggregate. Um, I wanted to highlight social and emotional well-being. As Mrs. Temple said, we do a lot at the high school in terms of our signs of suicide program. Um, we just hired um, a therapeutic mental health counselor. Um, we, 19% of our students reported feeling um, helpless or sad within the last two weeks, and that's compared to 22% of the aggregate. So we were a little less than the aggregate in, that, in terms of that area. 
We were also less than the aggregate in the number of people, students who reported attempted suicide. Um, we had 4% at, at LHS versus 8% in the aggregate. Um, and 14% of our students reported self-injury, and that was consistent with the surrounding communities. Um, in terms of sexual behavior, 23% of our students reported that they had sexual intercourse within um, their lifetime, and 22% of that, that population reported that they never used a condom compared to 15% regionally. Um, we saw a decline in, I know I'm giving you a lot all at once, um, we saw a decline in bullying over the last two years um, from 8% in 2016 to 6% in um, 2018. Um, and we were lower than the aggregate at LHS um, in terms of incidents of bullying. Um, in terms of tobacco, um, alcohol, and drug use, we already talked about vaping a little bit, so I'm not going to go into that in more depth. But um, students, 20% of our students are reporting they attended parties where alcohol was used. And that has remained pretty much consistent from 2016 to 2018. Um, however, we did see a decline in students who were binge drinking. So in 2016, 11%, I'm sorry, it was 18%, no, 16 to 11% of our students. So we, we saw a decline in that. 18% um, of our students reported marijuana consumption in the last 30 days, and 28% reported alcohol consumption. Um, a high um, discussed area is also sh social media, so I wanted to talk about that a little bit. 23% um, of our students reported that they found themselves in risky or unwanted si situations because of information they shared um, electronically, and 22% of our students reported that they had sent or received sexually explicit um, photos within the last 12 months, and that's pretty much consistent with the aggregate, which was 21%. Um, the last portion is screen time. Um, we changed the screen time to topic um, from the last survey, so it's during a school night how much um, time are students reporting that they're spending on screen on the screen, and our students are reporting about four hours compared to 3% of the aggregate, um, or three hours for the aggregate, rather. So that's kind of an overview. Again, that's a lot of information. As Dr. Harrington said, our report, the report is over 70 pages, so we try to kind of um, pick out the highlights. I'm going to have him okay. talk a little bit more about our stress and bullying survey. Okay. So uh, similar to the findings of the YRBS, there were some findings in YRBS that are a little bit different in regards to the bullying, where there was a high, higher percentage related to um, cyber reports of cyber bullying. Uh, when we met with students in focus groups, we were pleased to hear that there was a uh, that students reported a low level of bullying at the high school in terms of the focus groups uh, and also in the survey uh, comparatively you know 95 percent saying that it wasn't basically a, no a non-issue still concerned though if four or five percent of students are reporting cases of cyber bullying or actual uh, bullying uh, we do sim I know there was an extensive conversation in the previous presentation about this uh, I think Jason provided some insights about that. And what we'd like to do is follow up with students to find out um, what their understanding of bullying is and to, to find out if it meets the, you know, the, 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 def the technical definition of it versus a perception of it uh, being uh, uh, more of a conflict. One of the things we've discovered when we've had reports of bullying and we've done formal investigations at the high school, both Mr. Kamal and myself, uh, they're often, or I wouldn't say often, but there can be uh, allegations of bullying at schools across the country and, and certainly Littleton is no different and when we look into it we we find it often steeped more in a conflict that needs between two students that needs to be mediated because they're both sides we find that one person is alleging bullying and the other person counters with the bullying allegation and then we sort of straighten it out through a mediation process uh, we've had cases of confirmed bullying at the high school there's no question about that in my 10 years as principal and we've taken uh, the necessary disciplinary action as well as, um, you know, counseling um, interventions for both the, the the perpetrator of the bullying as well as the victim of the bullying. Uh, so uh, I just wanted to acknowledge that. 
Uh, going to the biggest concern we had both in the survey that was done locally with the fo and the focus, the follow-up focus groups was the high level of reported academic stress. In fact, most of our discussion with students centered on this about around student workload, uh, their feeling, or their questions or concerns around uh, abundant homework or what they perceived as busy work at times. Um, so we really want to dig down into that with our school leadership team as well as with the faculty at large and the students uh, to kind of come to grips with reported stress. We want to help students uh, by reducing this, uh, the stress to the extent we can. Uh, the school ex schooling experience growing up, being an adolescent is, can be in it, we can recall, is uh, be a stressful time. And we want to help make sure that we're reducing this, any unnecessary stress and undue anxiety around things, particularly when it comes to workload. And we also want to help students cope better uh, be more resilient when it comes to overcoming obstacles and dealing with situations that are uh, developmentally maybe they're experiencing for the first time but are quite stressful. So we want to understand their context, their perception of it, um, their interpretation of stress as, as well as reduce it to the extent that we, we can um, and also help them come to cope with it better. All those are th those topics are, under, uh, are, are abundant in converse, uh, abundant conversations at the high school, and we need to move beyond talk to uh, action. Uh, and what I'd like to do is talk to you some more about what our plans are in response to the YRBS data, as well as the focus groups and the school survey. Um, but I want it, before I do that, I'd like to just hi highlight, uh, I think the stress survey is up there. Again, very high levels of stress attributed to things going on at school or happening at school. Um, students reported that they became overwhelmed if they had, were given multiple tests on the same day. You know, that might be something we can work, we, we can work on that and see how we can develop an assessment calendar to try to, to minimize that or to certainly reduce it. Students requested more project-based learning for midterms and finals. Steve, if you could just scroll a little bit. We'll go to this uh, right below, focus group results. And the bulleted list is there. Uh, students reported that they became stressed if they were trying to prepare for midterms and then were concurrently reviewing new material. That's certainly a teacher, that's an instructional approach that teachers need to be mindful of. Uh, students reported that it was beneficial when their teachers dropped the lowest grade in the class saying that, uh, here's a quote from one of them, everyone is entitled to a bad day every now and then. Uh, students reported that they had too much homework and described some of their homework as busy work. I mentioned that. Um, a, a plus for our students for sure, and this was captured in the YRBS data as well as in our own uh, just sort of experience with students' enroll involvement in clubs and athletics and music program and arts. Many, many of them work, uh, have outside of school responsibilities. Th this can be really positive and it's correlated in the YRBS data with um, student, a sense of belonging, a sense of connection. Students ha tend to have less risky behavior sometimes when they're connected. We really uh, preach that particularly as the incoming ninth graders to be connected and to be involved in, a, in, a, in an activity within the school. But they reported also a downside that they, um, many of them have outside of school responsibilities and because of this, the, if the workload is too, too demanding in terms of time commitment, um, it, can, it can create a lot of unnecessary stress for them. And so we need to be mindful of that and see how we recognize that there's only so many hours in the day and students are often overscheduled. That's a conversation we also need to have with parents uh, around how they're, you know, uh, to encourage them to be mindful when they select courses of what a student's workload is like. They reported that, uh, students reported that they would benefit from longer breaks in the day. And so one of the things we're going to look at is certainly our schedule. If you scroll down a little bit, Steve, you'll see some of the interventions to date, as well as um, some things we're looking at doing in the, year, in the years ahead. Um, and I won't read all those to you, to you right now. I'd, I'd rather sort of bring them up in response to any of your questions related to academic stress or any of the YRBS findings or concerns. <coughs> um, well, my first question could go to, goes to both mm -hmm. principals. Um, how were the focus group participants chosen? 
Uh, they were chosen. Um, there, were, there was a random selection of students from different, you know, both kids who were academically motivated. So you can perhaps talk yeah. more of this. So we, we, we tried to balance, I'm oh, sorry, we tried to balance um, the student that we selected from students who may be in the AP and honors classes with some of our special ed students. Um, so we really wanted to get um, a good cross section of um, different students um, in terms of different levels. And we picked about 12 to 14 percent yeah. of the students. Um, yeah, so I wouldn't, I mean, it, it's, there was some deliberate, uh, t it wasn't necessarily you know, randomly pick names. I should correct myself about saying random. Uh, but it was, deliberate in the sense of trying to have um, a, a scattering of students who have different levels of academic motivation and accomplishment, um, different levels of engagement based on our knowing them with school and liking of school. Uh, so we had some kids that were very vocal and willing to share their opinions. I was actually quite pleased with that. I think the superintendent was as well with how candid the kids were, how comfortable they felt expressing often um, negative views of school. Uh, directly to an administrator and to a counselor. They were right out and about and telling us what they didn't like. Um, and I think that speaks well culturally that the kids didn't feel inhibited. Uh, um, but you know, they're teenagers and if you ask them how they feel, they'll, they'll, and you give them that safe <laughs> zone, they'll tell, they'll tell you. <laughs> and they did. It was great information and just sitting with the kids and actually hearing from that because we look at the data and like, okay, what does this mean? So to get the information from the kids. Um, was really helpful to know exactly, specifically, what are the areas we can work on. Um, so one thing that stood out to me, um, and you briefly mentioned, was um, the of the kids who reported that they um, were having sexual intercourse, the um, use of a condom. And if you take the never, the never wear one to rarely and sometimes um, that's 50 somewhat or no wait, that's 40 42 percent of, of the students um, which is awfully high um, and then also the you know the number of kids who said they hadn't talked to any adult um, about sexuality or AIDS or HIV mm -hmm. um, in the last 12 years, uh, 12 months. Uh, was that was specifically a parent on that question? No, it said okay. adult. Mm -hmm. um, so I just, I wonder about our, our sexual education um, mm -hmm. class and, and how it's actually reaching kids and mm -hmm. whether or not we're being effective. <laughs> right. I, I appreciate the question and concern. Um, Meredith Perry, who's the director of uh, district wide of the K 12 Health and Wellness Department, made a presentation to you just a short, I think it was made a bit even in as recent as the last meeting, mm -hmm. the last two meetings. Um, we also met with, we were uh, the Littleton Independent recently, did an article about, inter interviewed Meredith and me in regards to our health curriculum. I know Mrs. Steele also attended in her you know, interim role. Um, and uh, we we did discuss this and review it with her. I, I know that Meredith uh, covers these topics. Um, you know, it's particularly you mentioned, you know, HIV and that topic. So that was sort of surprising to me that students maybe they don't uh, they, they wouldn't recall that. Right. Um, she talks about various forms of contraception and things like she that. She was part of our um, YRBS review, and it's something she's aware of and she's targeting. Classroom. Yeah, she did speak to that. Some of these um, results are, were perplexing, but it was concerning, though. I want to respond to you directly that we we were higher than the aggregate there at the high school, um, and we we need to address that. And when the topic of sexual harassment too came up in the data, if you in, if you look at the report, where we were also students reported a higher level of that at the high school than they did in the aggregate. So we need to look at that and see what's going on there. That was just concerning to me. Um, you know, so in that particular category of sex and sex harassment, those are some areas we need to look at and address. Um, and one thing that I, I wondered about in terms of at least the having a conversation <coughs> with a, an adult piece is 
where they might see a class as a lecture rather than a conversation yeah. and is there a way that we can make that more a conversation and yeah, that's interesting and to including me including I'll kids bring that back to Meredith I, having been in Meredith's class over the years um, I know she creates that environment I know Beth was her neighbor for years I would speak to that too she really promotes open di dialogue where kids can feel uh, unafraid to really ask any question or if they're uncomfortable or feeling awkward even in front of the group she tries to create that opportunity for them to come and seek her out afterward after class or on their own after school and many students over the years have done that where they don't might not bring something up in the classroom uh, so we could we'll certainly bring it to her attention to say what are we doing here is there something more we could do in the health curriculum she is our sole health teacher so she has a really good uh, hand, hand on the you know, or sense of the pulse of what's going on there. She knows the nitty gritty, and she would be able to speak specifically to it. Um, you know, some of this, you know, it, it, you have to wonder what else is going on in the conversations at home around these topics too. And um, you know, and there's also a, there's a pro, there's also a program in the middle school where they discuss this too. Right? There's a, there's a review of that as part of the health curriculum. So, I hear you. Um, are condoms available at the high school? Uh, they are in the nurse's office. Uh, yep. Um, so I've noticed, um, you know, um, sorry, let me formulate a sentence here. Okay. <laughs> um, there was a high reported amount of stress. Yes. And a low reported amount of sleep. Yes. <laughs> Which um, are go together often. Yeah, <laughs> right. So, I mean, right. I'm sure we you're were hired about it, we, but we I'd like to hear some. Uh, I mean, and did you learn anything about why the students report their um, not, sleeping? not sleeping? Yes, they, that came up in the focus groups. And I think you could speak to that, Maureen. Uh, but I would say that when the group I, that, that's something I, t both Mr. Camo and I talked to students about that in our, B and, um, we have back to school meetings in September. And we're aware of, the, you know, the data around the importance of sleep and things like that. And we bring that up to all our class meetings. I mean, for what it's, that, that's more of a lecture, right? Where we're reminding them, like, being good fathers and saying, get some sleep and things like that. I mean, Remember I that? Like that. But, right. yeah. <laughs> but there's more to that, you know, teaching yeah. them strategies about that. What the students did report, though, was that outside school activities, a workload, I had some students uh, on my school council uh, share with me that they're up very late. Uh, some students were involved in a robotics program that kept them up. You know, they were after school hours. Uh, they were out late doing working on that. Uh, some students are, you know, on an athletic field, or in a, you know, sometimes it's not even LHS sport. They're participating um, in something else like figure skating, and that that can that can impact them. What the timing of the practice? I know in the theater every year. I've heard about this in the theater program. When they're going through the month before, when they're going through all the, the more intensive rehearsals, those kids are out late, they're practicing their lines. Uh, so uh, it definitely is related to academic workload, students feeling like they have too much homework. On top of having a lot, being a, we have a really high percentage of students who are involved in outside or after, I wouldn't say outside of school, but after school activities. However, the downside is that the students are feeling like they're not getting enough sleep. I mean, like Dr. Harrington said, they pretty much said homework and activities. And, and they kind of, the students kind of felt like teachers don't know they have other responsibilities, but that's, you know, again, their perception. Um, yeah. I remember there was one student who was very open saying, he was, he, he was sort of looking at the other kids sort of funny. and. What are, you, what are you talking about? What homework? <laughs> it, we, we really did have a cross section of students. He says, "You know, I don't, have, I don't really get." I was in that focus. <laughs> I remember that? He was so, he was like, what's, what's wrong with you people? Why do you, why are you, why are you, not, why are you up so late? Um, you know, because he had, he had a study hall or something, and he just had a different way of approaching his homework and getting it done. Uh -huh. We have a lot of perfectionism in them, and that came up too. We have a lot of kids who are overachievers, trying extra hard, <laughs> putting in extra time, wanting to get that A. We have a high percentage of students who get A's and B's, and, uh, and they put in the time to get them. And I think there, there's a competitive nature to the high school oh, yeah. where students want to be in AP and honors classes, so that contributes to their stress level at times. 
the teachers reported when we brought this up to, to staff and the school leadership team in particular they said they thought students were multi well, students would claim to be multitasking but taking sometimes too long on their homework because they weren't being as mindful as they should be they were they had a TV on they had the phone out this is what I heard from repeatedly from teachers and some students reported too that's true we have our phone on we have the TV we're they, they do, they're doing all kinds of things at the same time rather than just doing their homework but I did get clarification from other students who said I don't do that and I still take it still takes me a long time to do my homework and get everything done and get to bed at a reasonable hour we know teenagers by just with some of the sleep studies that they tend to stay up later function later almost I don't think they're quite nocturnal but they they do stay up they prefer to be that's when sometimes they some kids are just peaking you know in terms of their energy level and and being up late um, and they have to get up very early to come to our school because we start at 7 25 in the morning and some of our students really find it difficult to pull back on what they're doing I mean, they're, they're trying to be as uh, active and engaged as they can and, and they're trying to figure out what colleges are going to look for on their resume and on and on and on and, and I think they really struggle with trying to find balance and, and trying to make sure they're doing the right thing for the future, and we need, we need to, to certainly continue and, and perhaps entertain more conversations mm -hmm. in that area. I think one to topic we discussed was the bell schedule and kind of reviewing yeah. the bell schedule. So just, a, and I think that's a good moment to sort of chime in on some of the things that are, are highlighted. If you scroll uh, down a little bit, Steve, you'll see some highlights, updates, and next steps. Uh, as you all know, we hired a therapeutic mental health counselor in, in December. We implemented a 20-minute advisory session. I think I've mentioned that at a previous school committee <coughs> meeting. I, uh, is, that, it's a, is, that the, is that the YRBS one? He has to go back to the, the other one. Uh, that's in the, yeah. And then, uh, yep, perfect. And we have placed a, a strong emphasis district-wide and, and also in the high school on social emotion, emotional learning, both in terms of professional development, but how go teachers have set goals around this, are conducting activities around it in their classroom. Uh, we've scheduled some presentations for next year. Some of them have yet to be officially scheduled. One that has is the cyber safety one. We're concerned about some issues with students uh, share, you know, sexting and sharing images, explicit photos and things online. We want to remind them of uh, the importance of not doing that. Uh, they have had presentations on that in the past, both at the high school and I think also at the middle school, I think. Uh, that maybe it was at the DA who went last year or the year before to the middle school. Um, uh, Meredith Perry integrated the Catch My Breath anti-vaping curriculum either this year or the year before. Um, and you also have had the student school resource officer come into the staff meeting because some of us didn't know what vapes look like because they can be easily concealed. So he, he showed us vapes and what to look for, that kind of thing. We are higher in the, than the aggregate in vaping. I reported vaping. Some of it occur, you know, it could be occurring on school grounds. Not it could be in the parking lot. It could be after school hours. It's happening on campus. There's no question about it. We've caught students with vapes. It's happening in the restrooms. I've heard it maybe even happen because they can easily um, hide it, and it's not really. It's hard to sometimes to detect uh, that they can. A teacher can turn their back to work, write something on the board, and they can have it in their sleeve and just vape in the classroom. I've heard reports from students of witnessing that in some cases, and that was even last year or the, in the year before. So vaping has been with us and continues to be a, you know, a, a serious concern, especially among high school principals in the region. Um, so we're, we're going to bring in a specialist to talk to parents about vaping addiction and uh, the addictive behaviors <coughs> and its effect on, it, on the brain. Uh, next year, uh, we're also going to continue, as we always do, to talk about driving safety and distracted driving. Uh, those are some presentations we plan for next year. Uh, and I think Maureen already mentioned one of the things we're looking to do is adjust our bell schedule, uh, both in terms of class time, break time, passing time, and lunch time. We're trying to build consensus among the faculty around this issue. Uh, it wouldn't affect the start and stop times of school. That's contractual. It needs to be negotiated. Uh, but the time, how we use our time during the school day uh, during the hours uh, from the beginning to the end of, to the last bell we do have some flexibility there uh, we would certainly be looking for the endorsement of the superintendent for uh, any proposed bell schedule change uh, but we're really looking to get as many faculty on board with that as possible so it's successful and we could implement it pretty soon uh, so that's something we we think that students have asked for that that came up in the focus groups mm -hmm. so, okay. Sorry. What would the goal? What's the goal of this schedule uh, change? Yeah, the schedule change. Trying to do? Yeah, uh, 
periods would be lengthened, uh, provide some, a little bit more time, for, even potentially for lunch. We're looking, we're not sure how, we have a really condensed lunch period time, 22 to 25 minutes if you call it the passing time. That's tricky without changing the school the start or end time, mm -hmm. uh, or this, the end time. <laughs> um, uh, you know, there's only so many hours we have to, to maneuver w in the minutes, uh, but we could stretch it out over like, and set, you know, we have a five, uh, very traditional schedule of seven periods, about 49, 50, 49 minutes exactly each period. Um, and we run, it, the, the specific thing that students were looking for was, why do we have to take seven classes a day, you know, potentially six, seven classes a day? Some kids don't take a study, so they have seven classes a day. That increases their workload in the evening and impacts their sleep. If they could have a night off, if we had a six period day, um, they would be able to have maybe a night off from a particular class. Homework could also be scheduled differently. We really want to have an intensive conversation with the faculty around how they assign things and stretching it out over days, not necessarily having so many assignments as traditional teachers do, having it do the next day, checked as soon as you arrive in the classroom. I always remember that, uh -huh. you know, having your homework out. Um, teachers don't, are doing that less and less. They're giving students windows to do work. But there are some teachers who have such a, um, aggressive pacing for various reasons um, because it, the you know high expectations and they have a, a, a they feel they have a tremendous amount of content to get through that they're um, they're keeping kids you know working really hard and checking things daily and homework teaches great homework differently some count it as great some don't count it as all at all so we need to sort of get on the same page with that and get some um, get, get a sense of what our guidelines are for homework as a faculty what's the best practices for homework there's been a lot of literature in education written about this in the last 20 years Thank you. I still struggle with uh, the concept of the number of classes that we offer and I I remember <laughs> vividly when we went from uh, four by four block to, to the alternate schedules of, of the seven classes a day and the reason for that was the, the, the uh, time span between taking a course one semester and may not take may not be able to take the successor course to the next year but when you look at the research on, on retention uh, in my opinion it, it doesn't make that much of a difference and what we've, we've done is we've doubled almost doubled the number of courses that students are responsible for on a daily basis so then we get into the conversation, we, we talk about having more time to explore topics in depth. Well, more time means more time in class as well. I mean, there's no black and white answer to this, but I, I think in your exploration, I'd really like you to, to have those conversations and, and, and maybe reach out to some schools that have gone back to the traditional 4x4 four four schedule. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's some, the, some merit in that. Uh, I, I've, at schools and districts I've been in where it's been four by four block except for the uh, math and, and ELA curriculum. It's a little harder to do in a school our size. But right. I mean, there are some flexible options scheduling options, absolutely, yeah. And we have a frenetic pace throughout the day, um, you know, with so limited passing time. Students, even just to have a break, you know, to have a time, when we do professional development for teachers, or for, even for administrators, there's always a break in the morning. There's, a, there's an afternoon cookie time. You know, there's a coffee, a bathroom break. You always see teachers getting up and standing and because they can't sit still. Yeah, for and then all that the time. facilitator yep. says, "Come back in 15 minutes." You know, to have some type of recognition that the kids, students, if when taught how to manage that type of format, they can they're responsible enough to handle it, and they'd be they'd be appreciative of it as our adults. So I think we need to. We're going to have to, we, we've heard them, we've listened carefully to what they have to say, and now it's on us to do something about it. Okay. Thank you. Right. Uh, the only thing I had to say you kind of covered, but I, I mean, I think any opportunity we have to make parents aware of all of these topics that are going on, especially, I mean, the vaping for, was <coughs> what was coming into my head just is, mm -hmm. I think, a lot of. I was shocked at some of the devices that kids have and the accessibility that they have to these things. Um, it, but I would be interesting. It'd be interesting to have um, some conversations with parents and find out what they're seeing at home and 
get input from them and also make them more aware of all these situations that we're dealing with. Yeah, I agree. We'll, we're planning that for the fall. There's a noted, there's a, um, a well-regarded speaker who's making the rounds of all the high schools, and uh, she's from Massachusetts, and we're just, it's just a matter of us getting her scheduled for Dr. Po Ruth Poteen. She's been a very uh, nearby district. I think she might have even went to Westford, yeah, AB. She's well received. Uh, I think she's at, been at Harvard. So we'll, we, we just have to get her on our schedule now. Yeah, I, I know in my own experience, um, we had a speaker come in that uh, spoke about the dangers of uh, you know, electronic devices and different things you know, make, to make the students aware and the parents aware of what was going on. Right. It really hit home for a lot of and schedule both them on the same day and you know, uh, some thick cases. No, it was there was not. We didn't have all the parents, and it was all the, st the students got it, and some parents. Whoever shows, right? And right, they, exactly. It was and we've had yeah, mixed reviews it. about that. But we, whenever we do sometimes uh, different events, some are well attended or fairly attended, fairly well attended, and some aren't are very low attended. So right. we would definitely want to advertise it, get it out there months in advance. Really put a push on for, for parents to come out and attend those events because um, they're often very informative. Uh, everything's been pretty much covered. I don't have any additional questions or pieces there, but I do have a comment mm -hmm. uh, there because you, as you look at stress, sleep, vaping, drug use, mm -hmm. um, you, you pick them all off together. There, there's no magic answer to one of them. They're all actually interconnected. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the effects of vaping with the nicotine and the effect on sleep. Sports running until nine o'clock before the bus gets home, unwinding, then doing your homework. You know, there, there's a lot of things that contribute to this and there's, you know, I, I guess I wanna recognize and <laughs> emphasize there's no single magic answer to it. it it's a, Appreciate there's a lot of different pieces there. It wasn't until probably my mid-30s when I recognized I can't have coffee after 10 o'clock in the morning or else I can't sleep at night. <laughs> you, you know, uh, you, if I have coffee at dinner, I'm up until 2 o'clock in the morning, <laughs> independent yeah. of stress. Sure. Then all of a sudden you start thinking about other things. So, you know, it, there's no simple answers to these. And I think we need to make sure we're addressing it holistically across all of the topics and the interrelationships of them. And, and having, I think, helping students understand those interrelationships too would be very important for their own personal development in terms of understanding the effects of these different things. You can vape all day, but if it's going to make it so you can't sleep, you can't hold it on too much homework, right. causing them not being able to get up in the morning. So, anyway, I appreciate the analysis that the. People have done on the uh, results there, and and just encourage us to keep, you know, making sure we understand what's underneath the actions that are happening by our students. And appreciate the work. Thank They're you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. So you guys want to <coughs> back up? Yeah. We have uh, set up stage Yes. <coughs> So, um, just a little bit on the um, school improvement plans for the year. Um, I just broke this up into categories to talk about things we have done and things we are looking forward to doing um, going forward into next year. So, in curriculum instruction and assessment. Um, we had the implementation of a new math textbook that began in the fall, programs for studying learners. Um, we have an executive functioning workshop. Um, we continue to ha um, have math lab, literacy lab, and the academic support center. Um, we have VHS, National Junior Honor Society, and Problem of the Week for our advanced learners. Interdisciplinary units and projects. Um, sixth grade does the breadwinner, and seventh and eighth has science fair projects that they work on collaboratively. Modified daily schedule, as I talked about before, to include a rotation in the morning and the afternoon. And this year we focused on the review of the social studies frameworks and curriculum to include eighth grade civics. Um, we are continuing into next year to review all of our curriculum areas to assure that um, the, the materials we're using are engaging and uh, mm -hmm. positive, um, have positive student results. 
for professional development. Um, the PDC members at um, Little to Middle School attended, attended district PDC meetings to review their model. Um, business, uh, building based and district based PD opportunities throughout the year, including social emotional learning, technology, brain based instructional strategies, reading intervention programs, vertical alignment um, of Littleton Middle School and Littleton High School French, um, the maker skills and project design. Administrators and teachers attended MassQ in the fall and NUMS in the spring. And we continued this year throughout our building to focus on um, social emotional learning in the classroom. And um, it, we will continue into next year to focus on our professional development to support social emotional learning initiatives. For community and communication, um, we had the school-wide implementation of Aspen. Um, the, we utilized the Aspen Family Portal, um, the weekend update every Friday, the message board, school uh, website, and the teacher websites, teacher emails, Twitter. We had Eat Lunch With Your Child Day. Um, transitions from Russell Street to the middle school and also middle school to high school. Um, we have multiple meetings throughout the year with Neshoba Tech for our eighth graders. Um, and this year we started a new club, um, which was a small newspaper called the LMS Report. Um, going forward, we would like to experiment more with community volunteers. Um, currently we have um, some community members serving as mentors, um, one for math league and another as a club mentor, but we really would like to work on having an increase in that area. For climate and culture, um, we developed and implemented a revised advisory program this year. Um, our, we do an annual review of our emergency protocols. We recently completed our second ALICE drill and we also do regular fire drills. Um, our best buddies program with our case collaborative um, we did a Veterans Day program and assembly, turkey trot, giving tree, um, our school picnic, geography bee, and spelling bee. We added this year, as I said before, a human rights club. Um, we also have mural club, family volleyball night, um, family cornhole tournament, and our transition night for fifth grade parents. Um, we are constant, we, in the three years that I've been at the middle school, we've had three different advisory models. Um, none of them of the three would we say was a complete success. Um, I would like to continue to work to find one that is a complete success. I don't know if it is, exists, but it is something going forward that we will continue to um, work on next year to perhaps revise that model again. Um, it's important to note that we have had advisory every year, just a different model. Um, for technology, we re organized our Chromebook carts for easier distribution. Um, the Chromebooks were distributed um, in smaller numbers for the special education classrooms um, and the um, academic support center. Our library Chrome, uh, Chromebook lab is available to all classes and students um, all day long. Um, in addition, we added um, document cameras for teachers who requested them this year. Um, we integrated uh, the virtual reality goggles and Google Expedition in our classrooms. Um, we continue to support our Makerspace C Lab, um, and we also have Engineering Club. Um, we do want to look forward to next year increasing what we do electronically. Um, we um, switched over to complete um, MCAS on computer this year. Um, and we would like to see that model work in other aspects of our building. So that's what we'll be um, working on through our school improvement plan next year. Jen, any questions? Yeah. Looks, looks great. I mean, I, I can personally say my sixth graders come home and very happy with a lot of the, these things that were, have been instituted into, into the school. Thank you. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about what you're, you've tried for advisory and <coughs> <laughs> what you're thinking for the future? We, went, we originally had a model that was a long period of time, one time a week. Um, and some people like that and some people don't. We had it um, on Monday in the morning. Some people liked morning, some people didn't like morning. <laughs> we tried the following, we switched it. Um, we tried to have it more regularly during the week at a different time other than the morning. Um, we tried that. Um, we had the groupings different because the kids wanted to be grouped with their friends. We tried that. Um, and this year we're doing a model that um, is more regular for a shorter period of time, but it's, it's every day. Um, and uh, to be honest, at each grade level, um, they, you know, the teachers came to us right away in the fall and said, you know, 
I really want to do this for a longer period of time with my class, but two times a week instead of five times a week for a shorter period of time. And so we've allowed that. And so that has helped us um, to look at the different models in each grade level and decide. So we have the, the, the flexibility in the morning with FlexBlock um, that first half hour of the day. So if teachers decide, you know, in my class, I want to do this in my flex block two times a week because my kids really um, respond to it, um, we've allowed that. So we have some different models going on this year. Some teachers meeting for shorter periods of time more regularly during the week. Some are doing two longer periods during the week. Um, and some are doing for a short period of time, five days a week. So we'll really be able to look at that model and decide, all those different models and decide um, how to go forward. What we have determined is that something scripted for kids as an advisory model does not carry over into their regular life. That's something that they did in advisory and they walk away and they don't take it with them. So we really want it to be conversation based, not lesson based, um, and really generated by students. Um, what are the important things to talk about? So the topics that we talked about tonight in terms of YRBS can be something that's addressed during advisory um, and really have that model be flexible. <laughs> in all honesty, some teachers are extremely comfortable with, with that, um, that model and having those kinds of open conversations with kids and frankly, some people are not. And so those are the instances where we have to pair um, adults together um, and figure out really what's the best way to work with those students. Um, some, you know, last year we had teachers say, my group doesn't say a word. They don't say a word. They, no matter what we're doing, they don't say a word. So we tried to implement, you know, games and strategies and things like that, more hands-on activities. So it's really just, you know, it really depends on the makeup of the group and the different kinds of things that we want to get at. But really it's to have an opportunity for open dialogue um, with an adult that they trust during the week. So we continue to experiment with different models and that would be something, like I said, I really wish, like, you know, across the board, maybe I need to give up the fact that I would like it to be the same across the board and that maybe that's not the right way to do it. Maybe we just need to allow that flexibility um, when teachers get a new group of kids to decide what makes the most sense for them. But it it's really is important to have it be a time where there's discussion and not just, you know, attendance and here's the announcements for the day. That discussion piece has to happen in there. Um, because that's where kids get to, you know, that's where those real conversations happen. Thank you. Have all of you experienced Google exhibitions before with VR goggles? Mm -hmm. Is that something you'd like us to do at the beginning of a school community? Sure. Oh, nice. mm -hmm. Great job. Yeah. Well, that'd be awesome. We'll do that. Do you have any preferences of where you would like to visit? Just let me know. I'll leave it at your list. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know it's virtual, right? <laughs> Welcome back. <laughs> <laughs> Long time to see. Good evening once again. Happy to give you an update tonight uh, from Littleton High School in regards to our school improvement plan. We'll start as we traditionally do, right, with the curriculum section. Uh, we're, I have some good news to report to you tonight. Uh, we're developing the AP Computer Science course for next school year. Uh, this is due to the flexibility of Dr. Hogan, who's our physics and engineering teacher. We're going to take, um, make an adjustment to his teaching schedule uh, for the next year, uh, and that, though the coming school year, and he's going to take uh, offer an AP computer science course. Uh, it's a beginning for us. Eventually, we'll have a well-defined computer science uh, program sequence at Littleton High School. Uh, but we are going to have establish a foothold next year with Dr. H due to Dr. Hogan's willingness to teach this course. He's already gone out and recruited students for it. Uh, it feels like he has a, a strong contingent of students who would uh, be interested, motivated, not uh, and interested, and uh, well prepared to take on a rigorous course like this. At some point, we also want to offer an introductory computer science course for the students with uh, very little experience or no experience, and then some type of intermediate level. So that's part of the program sequence. As you all know, and you've heard quite a bit about throughout the year, social emotional learning initiatives are well underway and we have presentations planned for next year, um, next school year, about cyber safety and responsible digital citizenship, we've already booked to the presenter. 
both for students and for parents. Um, and pe people will be hearing more about that when we, when we get through the summer. Um, the other th I'll, I'll skip around a couple of these areas because you can read the, uh, some of them, but I'll, I'll just give you some highlights. We are planning f for some program reviews. I'll be uh, discussing this with the superintendent and Mrs. Steele in regards to what academic areas we'd like to begin with. Um, so stay tuned for a further update about that. In regards to just scrolling down, Steve, a little bit to the instruction section, we will continue to emphasize project-based learning. I'm happy to report to you tonight uh, that a lot of teachers have uh, t uh, taken some the, the advice we'll be giving them and, and uh, started to implement more project-based learning assessments as part of the final assessment or even mid-year exams. I know that Mrs. Steele was a leader in this uh, probably a couple of years ago. And, 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 Lou, and it had to do with some uh, scheduling constraints she was under, but she realized she had the flexibility to do a project and it would be not only more beneficial for uh, what she needed to accomplish, uh, but for herself, but also for the students. So it was mutually beneficial. And now more and more teachers are, um, uh, they're starting their projects now, so they're, they're not having the old fashioned um, set, uh, final exam block. We still offer them, we still have final exams. Uh, that's, that are similar to the ones that students would all experience in college. But we also know that the work world is not so much centered around final exams, it's centered around projects. So we're trying to prepare students for that. Uh, this school year there was abundant professional development uh, focused on the instructional best practices um, related to Marzano's, the new art and science of teaching. All teachers uh, developed goals focused on implementing these and our discussions are about to get underway in terms of summative evaluations to see how it went. So uh, that's good news there. Uh, Mrs. Steele and Mr. Camo revamped the student support team processes uh, about the, over the course I'd say probably year and a half and uh, Mr. Camo next year will continue to document clear and shared intervention strategies uh, to help students who are struggling either with behavioral, academic, or emotional concerns. Uh, the next category is assessment. Uh, if we could just scroll up a little bit, Steve, so thank you. Uh, a collaborative, we, this is something that's been a sort of a, uh, something I've wanted to do for a long time at Littleton High School, and, and I really hope to get this underway uh, at the start of next school year, which is a collaborative study group about assessment and grading practices. It ties nicely into the data that we j just reported on in terms of students' concern around homework, assessments, how things are coordinated, the pressure they feel, the competitiveness of things. Uh, so we want to uh, get a handle on that by digging into the what, what our current practices are by looking at it indivi at individual teachers' syllab uh, the syllabus and uh, their course expectations to to see how we vary and how we're similar. Um, the, uh, the creation and coordination implementation I've talked about for now, especially in light of the Chromebooks about digital portfolios, is going to be uh, put on hold because. I've looked at the recent, the revised NEAS standards, the 2020 standards, that they, and um, what we really need to focus put first and foremost is developing a vision of a graduate. And that's something that schools are, across Massachusetts, but across New England now, are doing due to the New England Association of School and Co Colleges accreditation standards. Um, this will be a, a, a pro, this development of a vision will involve, um, I guess the, the term we use, almost too much in education as stakeholders, but it will involve lots of different people. It will involve um, ideally a school committee member or the school committee uh, input into what we should have, what should a, a student who graduates from Littleton High School be able to know and be able to do. Uh, parents, uh, community members, local businesses, uh, certainly faculty, student, extensive student input. Um, so lots of different groups will be involved in our development of a vision of what we want a Littleton High School student to, for the most part, be proficient in um, when they graduate from Littleton High School. So stay tuned. You'll be hearing more about that in the coming years. And then what we'll do is we'll attach assessments for that to see how we're doing, both formatively and summatively. And that will, I'd like to tie that into the digital portfolio um, project that, we, that we've talked about for a while. Um, we have prepared for and implemented MCAS 2.0. We've already had the English, uh, EL English language arts version of this in March, and the math one is coming up for our sophomores in a couple of weeks. Uh, everything went well. I thank uh, the technology staff as well as Mr. Camo for their, their hard work on this. I know he just sent out updates to parents and students about MCAS 2.0 math. Uh, professional development. Um, 
this is something I have put in there uh, in the in this is in our school plan uh, we continue to provide PD opportunities as you know across district uh, th that now involve even other districts Air and Sh Air Shirley and Harvard um, and we're looking potentially to go K to 12 or yes, is it next year, next year. Um, a lot of focus on technology integration um, the PD program here in Littleton is absolutely uh, fantastic and provides our staff with lots of lots of opportunities um, and you can see some of the categories where we've had uh, focus areas on professional development I believe it was Dr. Janian who presented last on the it gave a th very detailed presentation to the school committee and the public about this uh, I think in the fall so I'll, I'll skip the details about professional development uh, community and communication similar to the middle school we have lots of different ways of getting messages out at the high school uh, but we continue to advance, enhance and advance our uh, dual enrollment partnership with Middlesex Community College. We're also looking to continue to increase internship opportunities for students. Next year, and some of this might blend into the following year, we do in, we have, we've had a traditional uh, career fair, college fair we do every year. But next year, we, we really want to have a financial literacy fair. And I have, we have a, a member of our faculty who's going to spearhead that, involve the Rotary, involve the PTA. And I'm really looking forward to that and talking about that at one of next year's school committee meetings. We also, given all the findings related to uh, the YRBS survey and some other surveys, we want to have a, a health fair. And we're going to develop a vision for that. There are schools that do it. I was an assistant principal at one that did it many years ago. Uh, and that can be a real opportunity for students to explore various topics of concern a lot of those categories that were that were highlighted in bold uh, can be addressed uh, partially through a health fair just to raise awareness around topics maybe even some strategies for how to get a good night's sleep uh, promote a healthy lifestyle um, and like I've said before we'll continue to host special guest speakers about important contemporary topics I believe dr. Hogan has been able to schedule uh, a Nobel Prize winning scientist to come and speak a little in high school students in the near future so you'll be hearing about that um, climate and culture we'll scroll down to that Steve thank you so much um, we do pol based on all the survey data and all the focus groups YRBS vocal we, we delved into that as a committee uh, with the, the school administration uh, stress and climate surveys staff surveys of various kinds a lot we're sitting on mount mountains of data now we need to figure out what we're going to do with it in a really comprehensive action plan that's that, that can be accomplished within a reasonable time frame that's not too far far-fetched um, because there's a lot of systemic concerns societal issues things that are bigger than us you know there um, we really as Daryl was speaking uh, about uh, when we wrapped up the previous presentation we really do need to look at the big picture and see how the things are interwoven and tied in interconnected because there's a lot of things going on that are um, that 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 are challenging complicated uh, and what we'd like to do is really look at how our climate and culture at LHS um, can counter some of those concerns address them um, and really promote a positive a place where students you know love learning um, so stay tuned for an update on that we're working on that as a school leadership team and, and then more broadly as a faculty um, and next I'll just jump down to some of the stuff you've heard throughout the year but I would like to highlight one other item aside from the safety protocols we've had a fair amount of presentation on that already through during the school year a major focus of next year will be an explicit goal related to the development of student citizenship and um, their knowledge and skills of what it means to be a citizen their civic engagement really promoting that I'm working with members of the PTA the Rotary uh, various community members on this there's going to be going to be a group there's a group on being formed right now uh, we have a meeting scheduled for June to get the conversation started about how we can do this um, at Littleton High School uh, but it won't just be faculty led it's really uh, been being community it's it, there's a lot of community influence and support for this so I'm very appreciative of that so you'll hear about an update in the fall about that uh, last c category in our school improvement plan relates to technology We'll begin the revision and updating of our school technology plan this summer or next fall. And we continue to implement the one-to-one -one technology program that I know our technology co-coordinators have presented on already. It's a phased-in approach. We'll be uh, full steam ahead, all grades, next year. 
So that's exciting news. And thank you again on behalf of the faculty and the students at the high school for your support of the one-to-one -one initiative and the BYOD, that's it, it, both a Chromebook initiative and a BYOD approach at the high school. That's it in a nutshell, the speed version. <laughs> Erica? Any questions? I think I'm good, thank you. I'm good, thank you. Thank you. Uh, you know, we play ask. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> wait, wait, wait. <laughs> <laughs> Jen? No, Thank you so much. Yeah. Oh, thank you, thank you very much. Keep you on your toes, though. I know. I was ready. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. I think we're down to uh, new business now. School day start times? Uh, Daryl, you can. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll tee this up um, sure. here. Um, we, a um, resident is asked to uh, present to the school committee a request about revisiting school start times. Uh, we are going to have them on the agenda next next, next meeting uh, there. Uh, I thought it would be useful for us to just, you know, uh, put in the packet um, the uh, a little bit of the information that we had gathered from before. We didn't put the whole presentation uh, from before in here, uh, but really what it boiled down to is what would it cost for us to change from a three bus run uh, schedule to a two bus run schedule. And we had received preliminary cost estimates from the busing company uh, there. That information and the school, the ridership information is included in the packet, just as so background information so that um, we kind of have a little bit of the pieces here. You know, it's not as if we're not attuned to the issues about the school start time uh, piece here, but we are constrained by some real, you know, fiscal reality, fiscal realities mm -hmm. uh, there that may severely limit options that we can look at uh, there. I don't want to sound like I'm opposed to it, but I think we need to make sure that people understand uh, there, there is some cost implications to some of those changes uh, there, and, and this is just to help people be prepared to, to know what the magnitude of some of those estimates mm -hmm. are. Uh, there, um, but it's also something I think we're committed. Um, I don't want to speak for the board. We, in the past, we wanted to look at that. We want to actively uh, address and try to address the, uh, the issues raised by the community as well as the students uh, relative to start time. Um, but we need to again, we need to look at it holistically. Uh, there, uh, that on it. So that information is there for uh, just some background uh, uh, information for folks. Uh, in preparation for the next meeting when, when it will be a, a, a little bit more engaged mm -hmm. discussion. And in 2016, we, we did form a subcommittee who worked with some community members and uh, looked at various scenarios. And uh, in the end, when we sifted through that data, we came up with the, the two scenarios. And it's, it's all about trying to find a, a combination that that's going to take care of, of what we want to take care of with our middle school and high school and ensure that our elementary schools are still uh, you know, not going to school in the dark and getting home in the dark in the winter time. So we have a, a window of opportunity, but unfortunately when we look at all of the options that we have, it's going gonna, it's gonna to require a cost injection to do this. And uh, No surprise, I mean years ago when, when things were tight uh, during one of the recessions we had, uh, we uh, were able to, like virtually all districts, save money by uh, using a, a, a tiered approach to start times. It saved a you know, significant amount of money. And uh, it was a cost savings approach, and I mean, that's been 15, 17, 20 years ago that that happened. And uh, now we're you know, at a point in time where we're, we're revisiting it, and, and in some cases, uh, trying to replicate that we did what we did that many years ago. Uh, I would love to have uh, start times at K-5 similar and 6 to 12 later and, and similar as well. But there's only uh, so much you can do when uh, you have X number of students to, to pick up and uh, the X number of miles of roads that we have to drive to pick students up. So uh, certainly uh, that will be a point of discussion next meeting. And, and as a, as a committee, you know, can certainly decide what uh, you would like to do. Okay, thank you. Um, we're at the point, if there's any interested interested citizens, I'd like to speak on topics of the, to the school committee. 
Sure. And <laughs> Even it's just me. Oh, that's okay. We can miss it. Sorry. Sit back down. It's silly. It's what you call a stretching moment. <laughs> so I think I'm supposed to say, like, to start this off, or do I just talk? Name and address. Um, Olivia Rosenblum, 79 Neshoba Road, for limited amounts of time <laughs> now that I'm a college student. Um, firstly, it's nice to be back. It probably won't surprise you that once I got back to campus, I immediately joined student government. Um, and I can now stay up a lot later than I could when I came to these meetings, because <laughs> ours don't start until 8. Um, but a big thing that I learned with that was that and I'm, it's college versus high school, and it's time, but like how much students care. So when we're talking about making changes and things like that, and like the surveys too, but that's a separate side note in my head. Um, like talk to students, be like, hey, after school, or we're gonna have a table set up, tell us what you think about later start times or whatever, because they're willing to share their feedback. I love the focus group ideas. And just with the surveys, I know they're important because I've done them and I've been in the meetings where we've talked about them before. But people actively hate them. <laughs> <laughs> like, when I was a senior and I did it for the last time, we like got the email, we clicked on the link, and then people read the first questions and like actively groaned. Mm -hmm. um, and that doesn't mean stop doing them, but also know that like, there's definitely kids in my homeroom who did not read all the questions and just picked a side and worked their way down or did like back and forths. Um, which like we all know happens. We get bored. It's like a hundred questions. Um, but just something to keep in mind and also I'm in my friend group in college I'm coming from one of the smallest districts. Um, there's one girl who's smaller than me and her class was 22. Mm -hmm. um, but other than that, most of my friends graduating classes were quadruple to like a thousand times bigger than mine. Um, which again, little town is what I call it to my friends. Um, but when we say or when you guys share the percentages, that's more because we're almost a hundred per grade or it was for my year. That's not just like X percent, it's three students. It's, mm -hmm. there's actual faces that go with them. Um, I think that's like worth, I mean, you guys pointed it out earlier, especially if the middle school and 6% like saying that they had tried to commit suicide in the past 12 months, I think. But it's something to like really bring back into your brain is that like, we are a small district. When we say X percent, it really does mean six students, 20 students, whatever the numbers come out to be. And also with the lunch break, I had an hour and 20 minutes in my fall semester to eat lunch. And I had no idea what to do with that time <laughs> because I was so used to the 22 minutes. Um, there are other random things I'd want to share with you since I'm here. Um, in college, and I don't know if the high school would ever look at moving to the system, but having a rotating schedule of not having as many classes a day and having them be longer. Littleton set me up really well for college work, though. Because for me, I have Spanish and English on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So after those classes, I do my Spanish and English homework. And then I don't have to worry about it because I was so used to having seven classes on Monday and knowing I'm gonna have the same seven classes on Tuesday. So I just, for me it set me up well to get my work done and get it done early. But I know that's not the case for everyone. And so again, reach out to the students, see what they want, because they have a lot of opinions. And I know you won't make everyone happy. <laughs> Had a lot of issues with that this year in student government, but they're there and they care. That's it. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Now we have the uh, 
district slideshow? Yes. Yeah, if you don't mind, just I have one quick announcement I'd like to make. Um, sure. I just want to remind everybody that uh, bus registration for next year is open now. It's uh, available on the Littleton Public Schools website. So register early for your kids, please, and avoid any wait lists for buses. That's all I want to say. Thank you. Okay. Now I'll play the slideshow. Yeah, every year we create a district slideshow and uh, I've said many, many times that uh, when you capture the uh, pictures that we put in our slideshows, there's a, a common thing, our theme, kids or our students more correctly are uh, uh, engaged in, in enjoying uh, what they're doing in our schools. And pictures uh, certainly say a thousand words, so I hope you enjoy uh, the video. Here we go. Subcommittee reports. Uh, PMBC, um, things are underway. Uh, I believe we should have uh, I think the contract went out for the pole vault um, box install. There. So that should yep. be occurring uh, shortly. Uh, there. Everything else is underway. Uh, budget, Matt, did you have any 
Good. Nothing new. Right. And then I just want to report that um, town meeting approved our FY20 budget. I want to thank the residents of the town of Littleton for supporting our school systems with the uh, approval of the town meeting budget uh, there. And then uh, finally, uh, policies. Nothing this week. All right. With that, uh, just one reminder, uh, town elections are on Saturday. Please go out and vote. And uh, with that, I will take the motion to Make a motion to adjourn. To adjourn. <laughs> second. Somebody needs to second it over I, here. I said night. it, sorry. I, <laughs> <laughs> I said it. Like, <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Uh, Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. We're done. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everybody.